glad to get together here at the beginning of the week. And uh, isn't God good? And hasn't he been faithful? And he sure deserves a lot more than he gets. But um, I hope we'll give him a good week and we'll honor him, love him, give him some time and attention that he so richly deserves. You know, God didn't make us for us. God made us for him. And he put us on this planet, all different backgrounds and groups and languages, personalities. He put us here for his glory. Revelation 4.11 says, and for thy pleasure, all things are and were made. And we're here to please God. And uh, just going to work, working hard all day, coming home, flopping in front of the television for a couple of hours and flopping into bed. How's God get any please, pleasure out of that? How does that please him? And so we're here to please God. I wanted to uh, pick, I picked up an old book and um, this is, um, it's been printed. This is a new edition, been reprinted by the folks, uh, Greg Neal and his folks at Berean Publications. Um, but... Um, this is some, uh, an old book of Dr. Hiles on salvation is more than being saved. And I just was looking at it. And the first chapter talks about conversion and salvation. Interesting thing, we will sometimes use the word converted for, be- for a believer. You know, we had some people converted. Um, and, and that's not a horrible thing to say, but it's, it's really not scripturally accurate. Um, you know, Jesus said to Peter, when thou art converted feed my sheep. And um, of course, Peter had been preaching. He was saved a long time before that. But there's something that takes place in the life of a a child of God when you're his. Uh, The illustration Dr. Howes used, the old planes, World War II planes, uh, troop transports, they're carrying all kinds of supplies, equipment. The war ended. I was still a good plane. And they'd strip out all the military stuff and they'd put in nice seats and carpet and, you know, overhead things or whatever. And that plane was converted from a military transport plane to a commercial uh, plane for just moving people from one part of the country to the other. And that plane was converted. And so it doesn't mean it wasn't a plane. It's always a plane. But it was now useful for the common man. And uh, when, I, when I got saved, I was born into the family of God. I was, the terms God would use is, is I was uh, justified, redeemed. Uh, I was uh, reconciled. I was forgiven. But uh, conversion is when this life that was purchased by the blood of Christ and I, I was saved, conversion is when now instead of living for myself, I'm living for him. Because that doesn't necessarily take place at the same point in everybody. I can tell you the night I got saved, I'd already, um, I think I'd already that night made the decision. I didn't want the world. I guess that'd be the, the thing. I, I've shared the story a couple of times. I walked out of a friend's house. We had music and lights down low and guys and girls hanging out and beer. And, and um, he came by and offered me a, a beer. And I said, no, thanks. It wasn't unkind. I said, no, thanks. And and he, it's when he made that famous statement, they're going to get you, aren't they, Bruce? And, and I said, yeah, I think they are. And I walked out. I think I'd already made the decision. I was done. Uh, I wanted Christ. I wasn't saved yet, but I wanted him. And the night I got saved, I'd made my decision. This world was empty. This world was so unfulfilling. Money, jobs, friends, dating, all that. As a high school senior, I had a handful of scholarships, different kinds, where I could have gone to a variety of schools. I wasn't real smart or wasn't real good at anything, but the, there's a lot of money out there to get kids into the wrong place. And, and uh, be, beware your kid getting a scholarship. I thought it was funny when I was a high school senior, I was offered a, a scholarship to the Coast Guard rowing team, an athletic scholarship. I'd never rowed a boat in my life, but you know, I was somewhat athletic and they wanted people in the Coast Guard. I could have just probably just, uh, I don't know how the Coast Guard Academy works, but but in any case, I, I sure wasn't a rower. But um, but I, I made a decision. I was done with that old world. And just the, the whole thing, the world, the, the, the term the Bible might use, the cosmos. It wasn't I was just done with liquor or I was done with the, the greed and love for money. I was done with the whole thing. The whole thing was unfulfilling. 
unsatisfying. I, I had a, I had a girlfriend, I had a car, I had a job, I had some scholarships, I had a, um, a, a oh, to a sense, a little esteem, um, not very much. Small town, you don't have to do much to get some esteem of men, but um, uh, I had, uh, had a good home, good parents, and. I didn't get saved because I was worried about going to hell. I figured I was going to live a long time past 18. I didn't get saved because I was miserable and hopeless. And, and you know, I finally found somebody that loved me. Jesus loved me. This I know. I wanted, I wanted to be done with this world, and I wanted Christ. And whatever came with Jesus, I wanted it. And when I found out about baptism, it took me about a year reading my Bible to figure it out. When I found out about baptism, I got baptized. I started reading my Bible. That week I got saved. I, As um, soon as I got invited to a decent church, I started going to church faithfully and reading my Bible. I, I learned to witness right away. I, I wanted it. That, that's, that's conversion. Salvation took place in a city park 10, 15 at night when I bowed my head and put my faith in Jesus Christ. That's when I was saved. The conversion, that is kind of a process. Um, at least in, in, in my case, it might happen overnight, but how it was implemented. But, um, but salvation is more than just not going to hell. Now you're going to heaven. Salvation man, a changed life that now is converted. And now instead of self, it's others. And now instead of money, it's, it's God. And now instead of earthly fame, it's the glory of God. Everything's changed. And by the way, you can unchange those things. You can get backslidden and turn right around and end up just as worthless and worldly as anybody can be. Um, I was thinking today, on an, back on, on another subject where I was going to go this morning, what was it that made Jesus so unpopular? What was it that made people so angry at our Savior? And um, I, I, think, I think the thing is, is lines. And I want to I just take a minute or two this morning and and uh, my, my tablet didn't get put out here, and I got a couple of references I don't have memorized. But over in Leviticus chapter 10, there's two or three verses I'll just give you real quick, and these may show up in a sermon here before long, but, but just in case not, you'll, you'll get something that everybody else didn't get. But in the Leviticus chapter 10, down at verse 10, and it says, and that ye may put, the, put a difference between the holy and unholy, between the unclean and the clean. And that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken. Now he's talking about the priests, the Levites, and their job was to make a difference. This is holy, this is unholy. This is clean, this is unclean. That was the priest's job, to show the difference, to make it very, very clear. Chapter 11, down at verse 47, he continues the same thing. Um, to make a difference between the unclean and the clean, between the beasts that may be eaten, and the beast that may not be eaten. And again, you see the role of the priest, a dividing. Here's the line. This is acceptable. This is unacceptable. This is right. This is wrong. You go over a few pages to chapter 20. At chapter 20 and down at verse 25. And it's still in the book of Leviticus. Therefore, ye shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean, between unclean, foul, and clean, and ye shall not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have severed you from other people that you should be mine. God gave us these rights and wrongs, do's and don'ts, because we're not the world. He severed us. He, God separated us from the unsaved world to be his own. <clears throat> this, of course, was Jew from Gentile. But he said, so since you're different, I want you different. I want your, I want your life different. I want your values different. And the priest's job was to, do, to draw those lines. If you want to look over to one more verse, I'll show you in Ezekiel chapter 22. And the principles all through your Bible, but I'll just show you one more Old Testament verse. Ezekiel chapter 22 and uh, verse 26, Ezekiel 22 and 26. Now, this is way up in Jewish history. Ezekiel and the, many of the Jews are carried away to Babylon, Jeremiah, and the poorest of the poor, the remnant that are left alive there in Jerusalem or in that area, they were eventually down to Egypt. And the northern tribe, the northern half of Israel's 
been carried off to Assyria 100 plus years before. This is maybe uh, 590 BC or 580 BC, somewhere in there. But Ezekiel is writing on behalf of God. Specifically, he's in Babylon, but he he brings a message often to to the priests. And so here in Ezekiel 22, in verse 26, he says, um, on verse 25, he says, there's a conspiracy of her prophets. So these, these preachers have gotten off. That's a problem. In verse 26, her priests have violated my law, have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths. And I am profaned among them and on and on. And just a simple a uh, simple quick thought or two um, about what made Jesus very unpopular. Jesus said, that's right and that's wrong. He drew the line. When Nicodemus came to him, he said, well, kind of these vague, educated t- kind of conversation. We, uh, we know thou art a teacher from God, come from God, for no man can do the things you do except God be with him. And Jesus said, you need to get born again. And Nicodemus says, well, how can a man get, you know, go back and be born again? He can't crawl into his mother's womb and be born again. And Jesus said, art thou a teacher from the Jew, come from the Jews? And you don't know these things? What kind of a teacher or rabbi are you? And, um, and, and he said, as a serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, um, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then verse 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. And Jesus began to draw lines, right and wrong. What, what made the apostles so unpopular? Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He drew lines. This is right. This is wrong. This is truth. This is error. And the apostle Paul made a big deal uh, throughout his writings. And he drew lines. Remember, uh, Peter was Peter and Barnabas were having dinner with the Gentiles in Antioch. And then some Jews showed up from James in Jerusalem. And and the Jew, Jew and Gentiles weren't supposed to be eating together. If you're an Orthodox Jew, well, these people weren't Orthodox Jew, for in Christ there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Uh, we're, we're believers. We're part of the church of God. We're a part of the family of God. And there's not a Jew-Gentile division anymore. Well, these Jews came in the, and the traditions of the heart got a hold of Peter, and he withdrew from the, Jew, the Gentile dinner table, and they were maybe having a big church picnic or whatever, and he kind of backed off so he could appear to be not eating with him. Then Barnabas looked around and thought, oh, maybe I shouldn't be here. And he went over too. And Peter stood up and said, you can't do that. He really scolded him. This is all in, in Galatians chapter 2. And um, see, the Bible is a dividing book. We Oh, everybody talks about unity and let's all reach across the politics. Let's reach across the table. You know what? The, the liberal hand reached across the table with a knife to poke you or to drag you to their side. Nobody's trying to meet halfway. Um, but it's not biblical. Uh, Jesus said, I'm not come to bring peace, but I'm come to bring a sword. I'm to set a mother against their daughter-in-law and a daughter-in-law against their mother-in-law. I'm, I'm here to divide. I didn't come to, to unify. I came to divide. This, this world of religion, it's all vain. You go back to the minor prophets. He said, I hate, I despise your feast days and your religious holidays. They make me sick. Remember over in Revelation chapter 2 of the Laodicean church, he said, because you're neither hot nor cold, I want to spew you out of my mouth. Now, what made our Lord so unpopular? Because he made it clear to those religious leaders, you're not right. It wasn't a blur. Well, maybe we could all learn some and we're all working toward a common goal or we're all trying to get to heaven our own way, but we'll all get there one day. All paths lead to God. No, Jesus said, you must be born again. And Jesus brought the, the, uh, uh, chewed the disciples out for picking some grain and rubbing it between their hands and popping it in their mouth while they're walking along eating. And they said, oh, you're breaking the Sabbath and chewed the, the Lord out. Your, your disciples are violating the law. And Jesus said, didn't you ever read where David got the uh, showbread, the holy bread from the priest when he and his fellows were sick? He said that the Sabbath was not made for, man was not made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath for man. The Sabbath's there to get you to stop everything and remember God. It's not there a day that you worship. And this is all Old Testament, of course. Uh, we have no Sabbath keeping going on in the New Testament. But, but Jesus, he hit on their traditions and he hit on their religious rituals and he hit on their, un, their uh, ungodly living. And oh, he, he just, 
he just drew line after line and separated and separated. Man, finally over in, in uh, Paul's writings to the Corinthian church, Paul was, he, I mean, he hit things hard. And um, he, he said to the Corinthians, uh, he said, um, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and, uh, and um, he says in verse Seven, purge out therefore the old leaven for you that you may be a new lump for ye are unleavened. Crave for Christ our Passover is sacrifice. That's in chapter five and verse uh, seven. And um, and he goes on over in, in the second Corinthians chapter six. And, and again, he just rails on these people. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers in second Corinthians six, 14. And, uh, don't hang out with the, the lost and don't fellowship with the, the world. He's a divider. And I'll tell you the thing that makes church like ours unpopular is I'll just say liquor's wrong. And then you'll find these compromising preachers. Well, maybe a little bit's not so bad as long as you're not drunk. And, well, what if, and there's some verses. If you want to find it, you can find a verse that might hint that. But what do you do with look not on the wine when it's red? Don't even look at it. What do you do with that verse? And, um, well, there's... The, look at look at the you know you've heard me talk about the law of first mention. When's the first time it's mentioned? You know the first time booze is mentioned in the Bible, when Noah got off the ark, grew some grapes, made booze, got drunk, laying there, he's naked, and some vile deed took place between he and his son, and his nakedness, and his drunken stupor. That the the first mention of booze was wrong, and you go through the Bible, and and liquor's a a horrible thing, and. People say, oh, you know, Paul told Timothy, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and then off an infirmity. A little. That's like NyQuil. Uh, that's like cough medicine. Uh, they didn't have all the medicines. We didn't say go out, go down to the pub and have a string of beers or sit around sipping your wine after dinner. See, when someone like me starts preaching, uh, look, you shouldn't be living together. It's called adultery. You need to either get married or get separated. And uh, no, it, it, you, you, you can't have liquor. And no, you're not supposed to be shacking up. And yes, you ought to be in church. And yes, and the word of God, see, the, the new world, well, all, this, all these Bibles, let's search the Bibles trying to find the truth. You see the average group of Christians sitting around six different versions of the Bible. You know what they're looking for? The one that makes them feel good. The one that makes them, I think this is the right one. Well, who gave them the right to determine what's right? I got a Bible that says this is right, and if you can like it or lump it, it makes you feel bad, it's still right, it makes you feel good, it's right. So you start drawing lines, oh, you make people so mad. And uh, a lot of the hatred thrown toward the preaching of the gospel, it's because we draw lines. And you cannot read your Bible without seeing the lines drawn. And God draws, you know, God draws the lines. There's men and there's women, and there's a line, there ain't no in between. Boy, is that unpopular. And children ought to obey their parents. And wives ought to submit themselves unto their husbands. Husbands ought to love their wives. And if a man doesn't support his own family, he's worse than an infidel. He shouldn't be, he shouldn't be begging off other people. And, and um, the Bible says if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. And you shouldn't live around letting the government try to, trying to get the government to feed you. Get a job and, and work and pay the bills. And all oh, those are unpopular things. This, this book is the most hated book. And you know why there's so many Bibles get printed? They keep taking this out and taking that out and taking this out. And, and they're trying to get one that's palatable to this old wicked world. And they're never going to find it. But I want to tell you something. Jesus is a divider. And he divides right and wrong. And there he, he's not, he is no compromiser. And I like when we went to Bible college, Dr. Houses say, you need to Cut two words out of your dictionary if you're going to be in this college. You cut out quit and you cut out compromise. They're both in the K section. Now get those words and cut them out and we'd laugh. But he meant it. He meant you need to decide you ain't going to compromise. If it's right, it's right. And if it's wrong, it's wrong. And we are in a mush society. Oh, let's don't make a big deal about a man looking like a man, a woman looking like a woman. Let's just, we can all blur together. And let's not worry about, let's not divide over doctrine. I know you think um, hell is just a, a state of mind. And I think it's a literal place with literal fire, but let's just don't talk about hell and then we can get along. 
And oh, some people think heaven is a real place, a real physical place. Other people think it's just a, a utopic state of mind and soul where we reach our karma. No, it's a real place, real golden streets, real river life, real tree, real Jesus, real people, going to see your relatives. But you know what? You start being absolute. Oh, the people get mad. And you know what? I'm going to keep making people mad by God's grace. I'm going to keep standing on the word of God. And you know, if, if my preaching makes people mad, I'm just going to keep at it. I'm just going to keep preaching it and I'm going to keep enjoying it. I love what I get to do and I'm not about to change. Certainly not going to change it. Please some crazy person who doesn't even know right from wrong. So let's, let's understand um, back to the priest in Leviticus and in Ezekiel and uh, the, the preacher's job is to divide and to show the people this is right, this is wrong, this holy, this unholy. And uh, I've got no problem telling the kids um, don't you be going to the dances and don't be going out drinking and don't be sitting around nightclubs and movies and don't go to the casinos. I'm dividing a line. Get rid of it. Get into church three times a week. Get into church every time you can. Get a Sunday school class. Go out visitation and soul winning. Get your get a New Testament and witness to people and let's make a difference between this old dark world and the light of the Word of God. Hey, let's pray for a good week. Have a good day. Thanks for joining us this morning.